This is the Friday, April 1st, 2016 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now are Naomi Bloom, Tom Fitzenmeyer, Ted Seifred, and Darren Newsom. Folks, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having us. Now, on the program, I really wanted to get to Derry. We have Naomi Bloom, <laughs> our Wisconsinite, here on the table. Naomi, where are dairy prices going? Uh, we've, I think, found a real short-term bottom here. The milk market found support at thirteen twenty-five, and then we had a nice bounce higher to the fourteen dollar <coughs> area for resistance. And the market found support based on the lower dollar. Um, in addition, the cheese prices have been a little bit supportive, and actually, surprisingly, our exports have been picking up pace. And we had um, <coughs> really strong powder exports recently, so that's been helpful too. Um, but right now, for the for the next leg, if there is another leg, it's just dependent on primarily the cheese price. That's the driver right now, and the dollar. Um, we're not looking for any big rallies from here. Now we're going to enter a sideways trading range. Um, because we've had our 75 cent rally, so that's about it. Okay, any hope that we could see 1450 milk as we get into the summer months? Um, it would really be dependent on the dollar. It's um, The supplies are sufficient here in the United States. Our milk production levels have been um, kind of tapering off, and that's still the balance between the Western production being down so much, um, but the Eastern states and, and, of course, the Midwest makes up for that. So production is just sideways. Um, the New Zealand market, though, is actually lower. Their production is down. They're anticipating a drought, so they've already called their animals, which is a little bit different in thinking. But um, So their production is down 1%, but the European markets are actually up nearly 4%. So globally, there's still supply, and there's not any issue of, um, of demand um, falling apart. There's not a lot of thought that demand is going to increase sharply. So I think we're stuck here for a little bit. But I think the worst is behind us. And hopefully a break in the dollar would give us a competitive advantage on the export yes. side to fulfill some of that drop in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you, Naomi. You're welcome. Now, we also did not get a chance to discuss the cotton market. And uh, Darren, <laughs> we did have cotton acreage come mm -hmm. out. Give us your thoughts on where this cotton market's headed. Well, I mean, just like you know, crude oil and corn and everything else that starts with C, we don't have any demand and we're going to increase production and hope for the best. <laughs> that seems to be the plan right now in cotton. We're down near five-year lows. Let's increase production. We're down near five-year lows. Looking at a chart pattern, is there some technical hope in this market? Oh, there's always hope. But, you know, to a lot of people, hope is a four-letter four word. But... If you look at the weekly chart, it's starting to build a little bit of momentum. If you look at the spread charts, we're starting to see some bullishness, maybe some short-term bullishness in this market. But, you know, long-term, it's going to be very difficult. I mean, because, again, it, it is like crude oil. It is like corn. You know, you can get these bullish signals, and they can try to run two, three weeks. But sooner or later, the weight of the fundamentals are going to come, you know, landing squarely on its head and push it right back down. Okay. Unless something dramatically changes. Okay. Now, so Ted. Oh, think yeah. The, I think the range is one fifty-six to sixty-two, or six one sixty or sixty-two. Excuse, sixty-two. Excuse me. Yeah. Too high. Or? They'd probably love that extra one, <laughs> yeah, there, Tom. But that's not. That that's a ways be, away. <laughs> we could. <coughs> we could see the market get back up into upper fifties, low sixties. I just can't help but think that if you do, you're going to see a lot of selling hit this market. Okay. All right. Now, Ted. You talked about all the rain we've seen through the Delta and across all of the right. Southeast. Mm -hmm. Any chance that we could actually end up losing cotton acres due to this deluge? There's a chance. There's always a chance. I mean, if it not, doesn't stop raining. But I think what we saw last year, um, too wet is, is usually a bad excuse for a longer-term rally. Um, and we seem to be planting more acres than we may need for cotton in the first place. Um, so I don't, I don't see that as a lasting bullish supportive factor for the cotton market. Okay. All right. I want to go to some of our Twitter questions. Tom, you mentioned on the program we're seeing China change their stockpiling policy. And we've got a question here from Jay in Paulina, Iowa on Twitter. Jay's wondering what impact will the change in the Chinese government stockpiling policy have? What can we expect in beans? In beans? Or in corn? I guess I don't know that there's going to be all that much impact to the bean market. I think that it's really a feed grains issue more than anything. And it, it, it's just another factor of more grain being out floating around in the world that needs to find a home. And I just think it's going to continue to define upper limits in both corn and wheat. Okay. All right. And we're close to those limits in both, in your opinion? 
those I, upper limits? I, I, th I guess I think so, maybe more than others do here, but I, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm asking your opinion. Yeah. Tom yeah. Fitzenmeyer. Yeah. Okay. All right, now, China's... I think the upside, upside potential is pretty limited unless there's the magical El Nino ending that comes in and burns the crop and all that like happens. a leprechaun, it's magical. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky charms. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, that's, that, that's kind of what it would be this year, given the stock... Because China's got 9 billion bushels of corn stockpiled. Is that the right number? Right. How much of that corn is still in actual usable condition for anything? Do we have any clue? No, they're going to be taking it and trying China. to make ethanol with it. Yeah, and so it. The, the, my thought, long term, big picture, like three or four years down the road, this is fantastic news because they're forced now to yeah. use this crappy corn and, and try to make ethanol with it because now they have to get all their ethanol factories that had been um, idle back online and they have a whole culture that is smog filled and with all of the global incentive to clean up their air, this is a wonderful reason to continue to have to build the demand base for corn. So it's it's long-term friendly. So I hopefully think. we'll get them hooked on ethanol using their leftover seven-year-old corn and then when they've burned through their stockpiles they'll need to either buy U.S. corn to feed their plants or U.S. ethanol to fuel their vehicles. And then Ted will come over there and help them with their cars. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, Mr. Ethanol. That's right. That's Ted, right. now as we're talking The ethanol, other thing too yeah. though, to continue on with Naomi's point, is that China back in 2012, when we hit record high prices in corn, started to move a little bit more towards the European-based ethanol model, which is using wheat as a feedstock. Now with this corn, big corn stocks and, and low quality corn stocks that they have, we're gonna see hopefully a conversion back towards corn for ethanol. So longer term, I agree with you, Naomi, that is good news for corn because hopefully we build that sort of, get that sort of built-in demand from China on a continual ethanol roll at that point. Now, speaking of ethanol, ethanol, de ethanol production yeah. has been much stronger than USDA had anticipated right. coming into this year. Do you see that continuing? Well, you know, it's, it's, ethanol is, is something where profit margins work or are at least on the positive side of thing, we're gonna keep doing it regardless of RFS and, and so on and so forth. I think with cheap corn feedstock, there's good reason to continue to uh, create ethanol. With gas prices being low, we're going to continue to see demand very uh, be good, so that's going to benefit ethanol from the blend. Uh, I think ethanol will continue to be sort of the bright spot of the corn balance sheet going forward. Okay. Now, the key component of that, of course, is crude oil and, you know, RBOB, the gasoline <coughs> prices. Darren, as we take a look at this crude market, where are we headed? What do we have come out this week that now Saudi Arabia is hinging uh, its position of freezing production at record levels on whether or not Iran will do it, and Iran's already saying it won't do it if Saudi Arabia does it. Let's be honest, I don't think it's going to happen. And even if we freeze production at record levels and we still have global demand not as strong as what's expected, it's a, again, it's a similar situation to the other commodities like corn, cotton, and so on, where technically they look like they could move higher, and crude oil still looks like it could go higher for no fundamental reason whatsoever because supplies continue to outweigh demand. And uh, so we've seen a bump in crude oil. We've seen you know, kind of the seasonal bump up in, uh, in gasoline prices. Most likely it's going to stabilize here for a while. Uh, and then I would not be surprised to see them start to come back down. Okay. Tom, any other thoughts on the crude oil as we take a look out at it? No, I, I, I agree. Uh, who's going to cut production? No, no, nobody wants to. <laughs> they can't agree on anything. They, they can't agree they on anything. Time over time yeah. over time. Yeah. So I, I, it doesn't mean we're going back to the mid 20s necessarily, but it's it's going up very much. It's going to be mm -hmm. highly unlikely, I think. Okay. Which should play into what Ted said in terms of keeping gasoline lower and 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 consumers out driving like crazy and blending ethanol with their gas and yeah, yeah. buying yeah. you know not buying Priuses, maybe going back to SUVs and right. uh, three quarter ton yeah. pickups and you know you name it. Oh yeah. You gotta you know, love that. I, I do love that. <laughs> now, uh, we've got another Twitter question. This is a question, it came from Brock in Baxter, Iowa, and it's a question that a lot of farmers have been asking themselves in a time of tight margins, where can I put this money to leverage it in my advantage going forward? And he's wondering, by adding 50% more on-farm corn storage, what gain can I expect per bushel? Who wants to jump at that one first? Don't well, do it. Naomi Bloom, tell us why. I don't think it is the right thing to do because 
Um, there are other places you could invest your money to make your farm better, and um, I just don't think it's the right move for right now. Okay, Darren? Well, you know, how much, how much gain can he expect out of this? Zero. I mean, no gain. If he doesn't, if, if the grain's not hedged, you're not going to gain anything in the market because you store to take advantage of a carry in the market. And not a lot of the markets have carry in them right now. Even the, even the old crop uh, corn made a July spread only has, what, three, four cents worth of carry, so it's not that attractive. New crop's out to 10. Mm -hmm. So unless you've got it hedged, you're not going to see any gain. You've got to have it hedged, and you've got you to be able to take advantage of the carry when it's there. The other, the other issue is if you, you have to make sure you use it as a marketing tool mm -hmm. because if you use it as an excuse to not sell anything, it's a, it's a hindrance to you. That's a great it, point. It, it, it allows you to procrastinate, which mm -hmm. generally speaking isn't a very good idea. I mean, obviously the, the market, the magical El Nino rally could come, and if you stored it, you'd, you'd take advantage of that. But... That's, I, I kind of, I agree with Naomi. I, I just don't see it as a great idea. Ted? I'm just kind of impressed that somebody's got some money to invest in something at the moment, <laughs> which is nice to hear. Um, it really depends on how long you're able to, to store. I mean, if you're, if you can sit on corn for five years, at some point you think you're going to get a better opportunity to sell than what you have today. But that's not realistic for 99.9% .9 of producers. You know, we've got banks calling for for to call or calling in loans. We've got to we've got we've got to get that cash flow, and it has to happen in the relatively near future. So right now is not when I when I would be really suggesting let's build storage. Uh, I think there are other places to be looking. Okay. Now finally, before we go, we've had a lot of discussion. I want to come back to soybeans about this being an oil led rally or an oil led mark we continue to see meal drop even on the bean price increase what does that mean long term ted you know we always get a little skeptical about soybean oil led rallies and here this week we were talking earlier beans were up eight cents oil was up meal was down um and that's got to be a little bit concerning going forward and also you know we've talked about uh, how beans could be buying some last-minute acres here as well. So there, there's some sort of uh, unsure fundamentals going forward. Um, you know, when you look at the crush, and I've been coming on this show for a year and a half now saying, you know, because of what happened uh, when we got, had a 92 million bushel carryover for beans, we ran out of soybean meal, so we had to ramp up the crush, and we had to use uh, the crush spread to do it. The crush margin was very good. You've seen that kind of reverse. I think that crush demand has room to come down here on the USDA balance sheet between now and the end of the year. I don't know, I'm not talking significantly, uh, but without soybean meal turning around and giving us some uh, bigger strength and really taking the lead, you get a little skeptical about a longer term soybean rally. I guess that my question, and I'm kind of throwing it out because I'm not sure, but when, when you've got the funds long, what, 100,000 contracts of bean oil, what happens when they decide they don't want to own <laughs> right. that anymore? Is there a vacuum under the yeah. market? I mean, it's like who's the opposite step, of what we're talking about. Yeah, who's going to step corn. in and yeah. that's right. what concerns right. me. At some point, they're going to, I mean, they've got the biggest long right. bean oil position they've ever had. Yeah, in right. history. it looked like the cattle market coming off that big high in yeah, 15, that's, that's where there's what, nothing under that's it. That's what right. scares me. I mean, well, you have a little bit under it because of the issues with palm oil and with palm oil prices staying right. strong. Right. Now, if palm oil starts to collapse, and the funds are moving out of it, which would be a good reason for them to move out of it, then you're right. That's a you know, lower, lower volume market that could look like cattle didn't. Should consume. bean meal users, your hog producers, your, your chicken producers, should they be locking in prices longer term on meal at this stage? Or do you wait until this oil-led rally maybe collapses a little bit? Naomi, you look like you're thinking pretty hard. What are your thoughts? I am thinking pretty hard. Um, it's a pretty good deal, um, and I would say with, with the corn market and potentially the wheat market finding a, a bottom here at least till 4th of July, it's probably a good idea. It's on sale. Um, right. Beyond that, though, yeah, you guys, great points. I, I'm not sure. I'm really not. Okay. Price is right for end users. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much yeah. across the board. Right. You can't You're go wrong. Maybe, yeah. yeah. All right. So maybe you could have bought a couple cents cheaper here and there. 
either way, the risk is to the upside, so adding some length and coverage for end users across the board is, is not a bad idea. Okay. Now, we're going to have to wrap this up. This has been a very, very profitable discussion for me and I hope for a lot of our viewers. But I want to ask, we'll start with Darren. Mm -hmm. Give us your final thoughts. Give us two sentences. What should we take away as we look out to this planning season? As we look out towards this planning season, you know, we can't get too wrapped up in the prospective planning's number. It's only the first one. Uh, it'd be like saying that the Iowa caucus has decided who the president's going to be. So, you know, Naomi had a great point. Probably the most bearish numbers we're going to see. We've got to go forward. There's going to be a lot of marketing opportunity from here. Uh, we're going to have to use them when they come around. All right. Ted, final thoughts. We have two surveys. We have two acreage, ba acreage surveys out there right now. You have Allendale at just above 90, which pulled about 850 producers, and you have the USDA at 93.6. Uh, surveys are surve surveys are surveys. You got to give a fair amount of credence to that. But you wonder if the sample sizes were too small to get a really good grasp. Uh, and again, with the things that we had talked about earlier in the show, there have been some things that have changed since both of those surveys are taking place. So you wonder if you end up somewhere in the middle of that. I agree with Naomi. I think we've just seen the biggest corn number that we're going to see for this planting season. Um, you know, so it's still going to be a big number. It's still going to offer a little bit more of a cushion for a weather issue. But with the funds being as short as they are, it wouldn't take much of a weather scare because we're all senses, senses are heightened for weather this year. Wouldn't take much to get them out of it and give us a nice selling opportunity at some point in the next few months. All right. Naomi, final thoughts? Um, I, I think that producers need to invest in time for math. And the reason is because you have to do a lot of scenario planning for what's coming up this year. Um, if the USDA throws at us in June an acreage number that's $2 million less for corn, which is kind of, I think, what we're thinking, you need to be ready to roll with, okay, You've got then that week window where we have our 4th of July weather rally, and when we come back from 4th of July, things fall apart a lot of times. And so you have to know if acreage is this, and then if yield is this, what could ending stocks do? So that way, when the information comes up, you can just quick look at your chart and your information and, and be able to make solid decisions. So um, invest in time and get ready for your math and get your calculators and your paper and your pencil. Buy a good calculator. Tom Fitzenmeyer, final thoughts. I think there's upside potential here in corn. If it caps, happens to come along, either, either it makes some sales or if you think what I'm saying is completely crazy. Go in and buy yourself some put, get, get a floor in, maybe sell a call up at higher levels. And, and like Naomi said, get ready to, to take some action. I think you need to be more aggressive than that in beans. Maybe buy 9, 10, 9, 20, 9, 30, whatever puts, sell some 10, 10, 20 calls to help pay for it. Uh, get yourself a nice, solid trading uh, level of maybe not profitability, but pretty darn close to it, and, 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 and then see what happens when, when her 4th of July uh, date comes along here. All right. Well, thanks, all of you, once again, for coming on the program and spending this much time with us. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks for having Thank us. Thanks, Mike. Thanks to all of you for sending in your questions via Facebook and Twitter. Please continue to do that, and we will get expert analysis right to you. Thanks for watching, and have a great week.